Hello, and welcome to the Osteogenesis Imperfecta Foundation's monthly podcast. My name is Tracy Hart, and I'm the CEO of the OI Foundation. Each month, the OIF will be bringing you information about the diagnosis and treatment of osteogenesis imperfecta presented by an expert in the field of OI and rare bone disease. The podcasts are a part of the ongoing educational effort of the National Institutes of Health's newly formed Brittle Bone Disorders Consortium and led by the OIF for medical education. Today, we're very excited to have with us Dr. Eric Rush, a clinical geneticist and medical director of the OI and Metabolic Bone Clinic at Omaha Children's Hospital and Medical Center. He is also assistant professor of pediatrics, internal medicine, and orthopedic surgery at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Rush. I'm so glad you could be with us. Thank you. I'm truly delighted to be doing this. I'd like to start today by asking you to give us a little bit of the history of of OI from from your expertise as as a geneticist and explain why this is considered a rare disorder. Right. Uh, So because most genetic disease has only really been described in humans fairly recently in our history, there's a tendency to think of them as modern diseases. However, uh, genetic conditions like OI have been around really as long as humans have. And the further back in history we go, the harder it is to find true evidence of this. But at least one skeleton uh, was found in 1970 by uh, researchers in Egypt, which appears to have had osteogenesis imperfecta based on the appearance of bones. You know, this is a 3,000-year-old skeleton, and these bones were pale brown and were very fragile. And in this case, this, uh, this child skull was composed of many tiny bones within these open sutures. This is what we would call Wormian bones, which is a, a term probably familiar to a lot of our, a lot of our patients and families. And the teeth were discolored and small and was felt to have DI. So no, no description was given uh, uh, based on this at the time, and it's unknown what, the, uh, what this child's contemporaries felt about this. And later on in, uh, in the 17th century, uh, Malebranche in 1684 commented upon the case of a 20-year-old male who suffered from fractures, and, and these fractures healed but left deformities. And he related the work in Recherche de la Verité, that this young man had lived in uh, in a place called the Hospital of the Incurab- Incurables in Paris, and and that his limbs were broken, and and he he had described this as like those condemned to suffer on the wheel, uh, which is a very graphic description of this. But uh, Father Balabranche had commented that uh, many people came from far away to see this young man, and including the Queen, um, who we assume was probably Maria Theresa of Spain, who she was the the uh, consort of Louis the Fourteenth. So Father Malabranche didn't provide any descriptions that have survived, but he did mention that this man's misfortunes were caused by the mother seeing a criminal executed during her pregnancy. Uh, this would, uh, it, it, he commented kind of on the power of imagination as the cause of his ailment, which is which is, seems kind of absurd today, but was really in line with with his time, uh, and it just informs us that uh, that all of us are kind of functions of our of our period in history. Uh, and moving on to, you know, further in history, we know that there's uh, that some, some of the modern descriptions, the very early modern descriptions, started with a Swedish army surgeon named Olaf Jacob Ekman, and he studied at Uppsala University in Sweden, and wrote a, a dissertation entitled "The Description in Some Cases of the Softening of the System of Bones," and that's and that is a that is my Latin interpretation, which is probably not very good, but there it is. So he described the condition and, and, and described three generations of patients in one family, you know, keeping in mind that, that present theories of genetics had not been established yet. You know, Mendel was not planting his uh, pea plants in Austria until the 1850s. But he does describe the disease as a discrete, uh, discrete entity, and he called it osteomalacia congenita. And now this was wrong, but it opened up the discussion for more meaningful progress in, the, in, in this arena. Um, an interesting report uh, that also from the 19th century that I found was of, of a, a person by the name of Edmund Axman, who published the case of himself and his two brothers, and all of them had blue sclerae, tendency to dislocate their joints in an excess of fractures. And I can find no additional details on who Mr. Axman was, other than the fact that he was from Bavaria. Uh, but he does appear to have had um, had the osteogenesis imperfecta, probably type 1, but that's unknown at this point. And uh, Johann Lobstein, or Jean Lobstein, depending on on which side of the German-French border you prefer, uh, was a pathologist who who worked in Strasbourg, and he described a number of anatomic structures and disease states. There's a number of things named after Lobstein. And he termed the disease, he called it uh, 
Thyrosis idiopathica, uh, which is a, a bit of a tongue twister. And the name Lobstein disease has also been used. And, and occasionally we'll see these in uh, medical records, but not, not really very much anymore, and they're not really appropriate to be used. And what's interesting is Lobstein appears to have worked with uh, less severe forms of the disease. And probably patients with uh, with what we would call type 1 OI, and this uh, and interestingly, this allowed him to appreciate the hereditary nature of the disease, uh, and and in a lot of cases historically, the classification of La Maladie de Lobstein or Lobstein's disease eventually gave way to the description of osteogenesis imperfecta tarda, um, as it was understood that his descriptions and those of another person who I'll talk about next, Vrolik, uh, concerned the same central process, which was no no mean feat at that point. This is a really big realization. So moving to uh, to Willem Vrolik, he really described a wealth of both normal and abnormal anatomy. And in his works, he described an infant who died at three days of age with multiple fractures. This patient had, had very poor skeletal development and also had wormy in bones and multiple long bone fractures. The patient that was described had hydrocephalus and, and probably fell into the category of we would call type 2 or perinatal lethal OI, but again, that's speculative. And like Lobstein and like some of their contemporaries, the Vrolik understood that the disorder seemed to run in some families. Uh, however, he had a lot, a, a long way to go as far as understanding the etiology uh, because he, uh, he s- stated that the disease was, uh, was occurring because of insufficient generative energy, which is not something that we would use to describe the disease process at this point. And he coined the term osteogenesis imperfecta, which was possibly inadvertent. He may have just been using it to describe the, the skeleton, but not really to, to identify the, the diagnosis. But even so, by at least by 1900, it, it appears to be common to refer to all forms of osteogenesis imperfecta as such. And so I'll, I'll finish this question by talking just very briefly about what rare, rare disease implies. So when we talk about um, about osteogenesis imperfecta as being a rare disease, uh, that's a disease with specific uh, specific descriptions based on where you're you are located in the world. In the United States, generally speaking, we're looking at this as a as a condition that affects fewer than 200,000 Americans. Um, for any listeners that are in in Euro- the European Union or Japan. They have uh, different descriptions of this, which may result in, in slightly different uh, different incidents that would be qualified as being a rare disease. This can have implications in, in uh, things like research funding for, for treatment for certain conditions. And it's important for patients with rare diseases to understand more about what rare disease actually means. Thank you so much. The history is just so interesting, um, and it, it, you know, it, it just brings to mind, you know, the, the more we know, the more we can understand, and having, you know, this history is just so important, so thank you. Um, That's you absolutely talked right. about, Yeah, exactly. You, you talked about inheritance. Can you talk about that? Because I think, um, you know, with a, a complicated disorder like OI, it's, it's sometimes difficult to understand how it's inherited. Could you talk about that? Absolutely. Uh, the inheritance of, uh, of OI is, is a bit more complex than sometimes it seems on face. The vast majority of patients with OI have what we would call an autosomal dominant faction, and this means it's, it's, inherited, um, it's inherited directly between generations in some cases, um, and sometimes it's a new uh, condition. So it's common for patients, particularly with less severe forms of OI, to have multiple generations of family members affected. And in those instances, we know that if a parent has a dominant form of OI, each of their children will be at a 50% risk for also having OI. And there are also patients with a new mutation in one of the one of the genes that cause OI, one of the collagen one genes. And although those patients' parents are at low risk for occurrence of having a, another child with OI, that risk is not zero. And those patients themselves, even if they are a, a new change in in their family, they they are still at at fifty percent risk for passing that mutation on to their future child. And more recently discovered and, and less common are the recessive forms of OI. And, and keep in mind that in order to re- inherit a recessive disease, a person must have two non-functional copies of the gene, one from each parent. And in nearly all those cases, uh, those parents are going to be asymptomatic carriers. And there are some major differences in the counseling we give, pay, uh, we give families with a recessive mutation. First, if you have the same two parents of a child with a recessive form of OI, they would have a one in four, 25% chance of inheriting the mutation. 
And second, that the patients themselves will, um, will have children who will be carriers of this condition. But however, because we believe that those recessive forms of OI are quite rare, the carrier rate in the general population is also going to be fairly low. Therefore, in those cases, uh, it's not nearly so likely that the partner of a person with a recessive form of OI will also be a carrier for the same form. We make a few su assumptions with that, but overall, we feel that the total risk to future generations in those cases is, is correspondingly fairly low. But there's even within the autosomal dominant, not as recessive, there's some complexity. And, and one of the complexities that, that comes up in conversation quite a bit is the discussion of mosaicism. There are definitely cases of somatic or, or germline mosaicism which can complicate these matters, and and these are sometimes the reason why we hedge a little bit on on talking about things like recurrence risk. You know, mosaicism refers to the presence of mutations in some but not all cells in a person, and we even divide that into into those two categories. When we say somatic mosaicism, we refer to the phenomenon of mosaicism occurring in a tissue or a group of tissues within the body. Whereas germline mosaicism refers to the presence of mutations in a percentage of cells either in the ovaries or the testes, which can lead to a certain percentage of sperm or egg cells with that same mutation. And the presence of mosaicism definitely impacts the recurrence risks, but even if it's known, it's often very difficult to still accurately define risk, partly because how we collect tissues for genetic testing. And so just as an example, in, in the past, we often did genetic testing on a type of cell called a fibroblast, which can be grown from tissues like skin from a biopsy. However, in 2015, we don't do these nearly as frequently, and we frequently do, do our, our genetic testing on, on blood from white blood cells. They're much easier to collect and much less painful. However, uh, the identification of somatic mosaicism, part of, the, uh, of a person's uh, DNA being changed in their white blood cells, doesn't guarantee the presence of, of the germline mosaicism or the same degree of, of germline mosaicism. Likewise, if a person doesn't have any somatic mosaicism that's detectable in their white blood cells, it doesn't guarantee the absence of, of germline mosaicism. And this is important information because there's definitely been a trend as genetic testing becomes more common for parents of people with presumed new dominant mutations having testing themselves. And I'm not opposed to doing such testing, but again, I think it's important for providers and families to be aware of what, what that testing can and can't tell them. And if I can just end this, uh, this question by saying if there's, if there's one rule in genetics, it's the recurrence of anything is rarely 0%. And it's unlikely you're ever going to get a geneticist to say 0% or 100%. It's really not in our vocabulary. Got it. Excellent. Um, you know, OA is sometimes called, oftentimes called brittle bone disease. And, you know, I think a, a lot of people would like to know how come a bone disorder also affects the lungs, the muscles, the skin, and other organs. Can you comment on that a little bit? That's a really great question, and I think this has been underappreciated in the care of OI, but I think fortunately we're starting to look at it more and more. And although collagen 1 is most highly expressed in bones, if you're looking at the protein content of bones, a very, very high percentage of that protein within bones is going to be type 1 collagen, so it's no surprise that OI is a, is a, a disorder that has a, a prominent bone phenotype. However, collagen 1 is also expressed in other tissues like the skin, the smooth muscle, the heart, and the lungs. And this, and this being expressed there would, it would suggest an increased risk of diseases in these organ systems in patients with OI. And although some research has been done on a lot of these, I don't think it's clear exactly what we should be concerned about and why. I think we're starting to get a little clearer picture with some of those, uh, some of those aspects of it, but I think that there's a lot of work left to do. And additionally, the, the functions of genes don't happen in a, vacu in a vacuum. Collagen 1 also interacts with gene products of many other genes besides those collagen genes. And those genes themselves uh, may be important for, they may have downstream consequences for other organ systems. Uh, and though those could be important implications in patients with OI. I think the future is going to be very, uh, very important for research for the extraskeletal manifestations of, of OI. I'm certainly very interested in this, and especially what happens to those, to those extraskeletal manifestations of OI when people age. I think that will be a very interesting aspect of, uh, of our research consortium. Absolutely. Thank you, and thank you for, for your work in this area. Um, 
this might take the, the rest of the time we have together, but it's such an interesting um, question, I think. Right now we know, and you talked a little bit about the history of OI, where originally we thought there were you know, two types of OI. Now we, we classify OI as 15 different types. Oh, right now, as of today, how, how do you see this, or, or why do you see this explosion in, in finding new genes and, and, and new types, and, and what do you see in the future, and, and why, why do we need to know about all these different types of OI? Yeah, I think this is one of the most exciting aspects of, of our of our modern OI care and modern OI diagnostics. Uh, we're at this point, I believe, in in the infancy of targeted therapy for patients with a variety of diseases, diseases including OI. And I think because there's a lot of interest in rare diseases overall, I think this is a really important time for us to be looking into things. We still define OI frequently based on phenotype. And this is often what we use when we when we talk about the traditional silence criteria. And sometimes we also will use these with uh, with distinct entities, such as say type five OI, uh, which is uh, which phenotypically is different from the other forms of OI and molecularly distinct. But I think that even looking at the at the combination of other forms of OI, um, you can see uh, that there are molecularly distinct entities which can exist, um, and and these are what we have defined as type six and through type seventeen OI. And I'll and I'll say, Tracy, not not everybody agrees on this nomenclature of uh, of listing patients from type six to type uh, to type seventeen. I I use it today mostly to illustrate the fact that there is a lot of uh, of genetic information that's being generated now, and there's an understanding that the, there's a lot of variability um, in the uh, in the molecular causation of certain types of OI. Uh, but as far as as using this molecular information to uh, to to uh, treat patients in a targeted fashion, there's at least two examples I can think of where a patient's genotype could lead directly to treatment today. And again, I think that some of this may be a little, a little speculative on my part, but I still think it's very interesting. I think one uh, interesting example is the use of uh, of the monoclonal antibody denosumab in patients who have type 6 OI. Um, this is a gene that, um, that, it, that uh, when it's affected, will influence the function of additional genes. And, and there's a, in one particular protein product that can be reduced called uh, osteoprotogerin, um, and osteoprotogerin being reduced uh, uh, causes the phenotype, or at least part of the phenotype, in type 6 OI. And what's interesting is that denosumab functions as a, as a way to essentially artificially restore the functions that this osteoprotogerin would have. And this has been studied in patients with type 6 OI. There's a, there's a group in Germany um, that has published some results on this that appear very promising. Uh, that, that people with uh, with type 6 OI may may specifically benefit from the use of uh, of, of the nosumab, and I think that the that time will tell what the long term consequences or, or improvements will be because of that. But I think that's a promising area of inquiry, and uh, an additional um, uh, an additional target that I'm um, particularly interested in is uh, is a different monoclonal antibody called romosozumab. And this is probably no, known by many in the OI community as a, a as a, 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 a as a target for the protein called sclerostin. And the sclerostin will uh, work to indirectly decrease the the function of the of a gene called WNT1 or WNT1. And what happens is is this romosozumab will target this uh, this sclerostin as an anti-sclerostin antibody. And if, if a patient were to have a, uh, a loss of function uh, in the WNT1 gene, uh, they would, uh, it, would, it would appear to be a very elegant solution to their particular problem. So you would lose your function in your WNT1 gene. Your um, romosozumab would target your sclerostin antibody and would, in theory, allow what's left of your, of your WNT1 gene function to sort of push through that signaling. And so this appears to be a very elegant solution. I don't know whether it's actually going to work uh, work as uh, as I hope it will in patients with with uh, went one mutations, and it might also be effective in people with other forms of OI as well. We don't quite know yet, um, but I can tell you this is one uh, targeted therapy that I'm uh, that I would be very interested um, in looking at further. So I think that there's a that there's a lot of uh, potential there. For uh, for targeted therapies in, in patients with OI that are can be really elegant solutions to their particular molecular problem, 
Now, again, as we understand more about the pathogenesis of OI and and, and even the even patients with collagen one related OI, which is still the vast majority of people, I think as we learn more about the uh, about those uh, that those aspects of uh, of the uh, of the disease, I think the more likely we are going to be able to uh, to target therapy um, and really make an uh, make an impact on people's disease state. Dr. Rush, how important is it, in your opinion, if you have an adult that you're seeing with OI who has never had DNA testing, what, what would you what would you tell that patient? How important is that? Right. Well, you know, when you're a geneticist, Tracy, everything you're kind of a hammer, and everything sort of looks like a nail when it comes to genetic testing. And so, but but even having said that, uh, you know, I think that that when I talk to a patient who's an, an adult with OI. Uh, the first thing I ask them is, what What do you want to know? You know, what is it? What is the information you're trying to find out? And in some cases, the information you're trying to find out is going to be, you know, is going to be very important information um, for yourself for, say, family planning purposes, or um, maybe important for patients, uh, uh, patients just their academic interest in this. And 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 I think that's honestly legitimate. Uh, but I think as we get more and more into a framework of doing targeted molecular uh, molecular therapies, it's also going to be more important to have genetic testing, and um, and, and so I think it's it's you know more and more patients are requesting this for that reason, and I think for um, for adults, it's uh, I think it's been it's been a very individual decision as far as how people have decided whether to pursue genetic testing or to not pursue genetic testing. Uh, I think for our, for our children who come into the clinic, it's becoming very uncommon for, uh, for children to, uh, to come into the clinic without genetic testing. Uh, so I think it's, it's kind of uh, you know, slowly becoming our standard of care that, that most, if not all, patients will eventually get genetic testing. And again, there's been a lot of interest in that over the years as, as genetic testing is getting, is getting much, uh, much better um, at a at a, ver- a fairly fast rate, and is getting cheaper at a slower rate, but is still getting less expensive. And I think that does have some implications as far as the threshold some patients will use to try to uh, decide whether it's worth it to do genetic testing. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, in the last few minutes that we have, um, we we touched on, and you talked a little bit about the consortium, the work of the consortium. From your perspective, right. can you tell us? Um, why why the brittle bone disorders consortium is is so important at this point in 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 the research life of of for the OI community I think that there's a there's a couple of reasons why I'm I think it's important and why I'm extremely excited to be involved in the consortium I think for one I think it it uh, it concentrates our research efforts in a unified direction and so I think that we are all better um, as far as research, when we're doing the when we're doing the research together, when it's being done in a cooperative manner, I think it focuses our resources in a much better manner, and that's obviously going to be more efficient and it's going to be better for the patient. And so I'm very excited for for that reason. And so I think that even in, in terms of a direct patient care aspect of this, I think it allows us to uh, to agree on at least some minimum set of standards of, of care for patient for the management of patients with OI. And so I think the fact that all, that all of the uh, all of the larger centers are, are speaking to one another about it will help ensure that that's the case because what we really want is to is to innovate on care for people with OI. Uh, we want to be doing high quality research for people with OI and at the end of the day we want to take good care of patients with OI. And so I think for the, all of those reasons, I think the uh, the BBD is going to be a, a very a very effective vector to do that. Excellent, and I know that the OI community is is very anxious to be a part of of what's coming next and um, being part of the contact registry and and all of that. So, um, well, I can't thank you enough, Dr. Rush, for for this really fascinating conversation. Um, I love the hi- hearing about the history and. Um, and integrating it into today and all the, the wonderful research that's going on today. So thank you so much for your time today. Well, um, and thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll have you back. <laughs> and um, for more information on um, anything that Dr. Rush talked about, you can visit uh, the OIF website, www.oif.org.org. We'll have um, the podcast up there, also with Dr. Rush, um, Rush's slides that he's uh, provided for us as well. So 
So thank you again for joining us and we'll talk to you next month. Thanks so much.